Hi, this is Scott Pringle from Jacobs Engineering, and I'm here with our October update for the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. So before we get started, it's important to sort of talk about what it takes to build premium transit in the Tampa Bay area. And in order to get a project constructed, we have to understand what the project is or projects to be built, how they're funded, and who is responsible for maintaining those projects. The Regional Transit Feasibility Plan is focused on identifying what those projects are. So the reason why we're even looking at premium transit in Tampa Bay is simple. We're going to experience increase in congestion over the next 20 years. We're going to continue to see more people traveling, which is causing a delay by 2040 of more than two times what we're experiencing today. As a region, we've also had limited success in attracting federal transit capital dollars to the region. We've had a lot of different planning studies over the years, over the past 30 years, but to date, we've never received dollars back from the Federal Transit Administration for transit in Tampa Bay. The only project that has the potential for attracting those dollars is actually just submitted within the last month, which is a bus rapid transit project connecting St. Pete to St. Pete Beach. So if that project is awarded, it would be the first in over 30 years in Tampa Bay. The purpose of the plan is simple. We know there's a need for looking at mobility throughout our region, and we want to find a project that's competitive to secure those federal and state grant dollars. So our plan will be guided by those principles. Finding the most competitive project, we're always going to look at technology and what technology means for us today and both for us in the future. And at the end of the day, we're always going to look at a project that serves our region today while supporting tomorrow's growth. We're just starting our public outreach process and getting out and talking to people. We recently held three workshops, one in each of the three counties. And you can see some of the statistics here. Regarding the schedule, we have two phases to the plan's development. The first phase is focusing on the technical work in which it's broken up into three steps. Step one, we've already completed. That is, where are those most competitive connections? Step two is what we're completing here in October, which is focusing on what should operate on those top performing connections. And then step three, how we implement those projects, starts here in October and will finish on January 18th which January 18th represents the closure of phase one, which is the development of a draft implementation plan. Now phase two is essentially a community vetting period in which we take that draft plan out to the public and spend eight months vetting that plan and getting input on that before we finalize the plan in September of next year. So some of the things we've heard when we've gone out to the public at some of those workshops, a lot of conversation surrounding the type of transit that people want to see in Tampa Bay, whether it's something that's operating on steel wheel and a rail, or it's something operating on rubber tires, such as bus rapid transit. But the most common thing I've heard to date is that we need to stop talking and planning for transit, and we need to find that project that we can start building. This is just quickly a list of all the activities that we've completed today. As I mentioned prior, we've completed the step one evaluation, which I'll give a brief recap, and then focusing on step two here in October. So step one identified our transit vision for Tampa Bay and those top performing connections. So if you look at the map here on the left, all those blue lines, the light and blue lines, serve approximately six out of 10 jobs within a half a mile of those connections by 2040. When residents, we're looking at over half or five out of 10 residents in 2040 served by this transit vision. So clearly there is a, a benefit to investing in transit for Tampa Bay. When we asked the public about their thoughts about the vision itself, uh, we had a lot of support and a lot of people really focused on, you know, you need to get me from St. Pete to Tampa or I need to get from USF to West Shore. So connecting those major urban centers or the regional activity centers was a common comment we heard from the public. Uh, once we've identified those top performing connections, those dark blue lines, in step two, the next is identifying what can operate on those connections. And we did that by looking at a variety of transit modes. We looked at ferry, aerial propelled transit. We looked at steel wheel or rail transit. And within that includes light rail, commuter rail, or elevated heavy rail. 
We also looked at rubber tire transit, which includes express bus, bus rapid transit. And the one technology that's sort of emerging both on the rubber tire side, I'm going to talk about in a minute, but the reality is, is that when we're thinking about the most forward-looking technology, the transit industry itself is moving towards autonomous solutions. We've had a number of examples on the rail side of autonomous solutions, connecting airports throughout the country, but a lot of the growth in technology, a lot of advances in technology have occurred on the rubber tire side of the industry. These images here are examples of autonomous rubber tire transit vehicles. There's a variety of vehicles here. The top two are smaller vehicles carrying between 10 to 12 people per vehicle and they're operating in traffic with pedestrians and other vehicles. The bottom left is actually an autonomous rubber tire transit solution which was just delivered to the Tampa International Airport and will be in operation soon. And on the right is an example or a picture of what we're calling a third generation transit autonomous transit vehicle. So the difference between a first generation or second generation autonomous vehicle and a third generation is simply that we're seeing increases in the amount of people that vehicle can take and the top cruising speed. Now that first and second generation transit vehicle, its top cruising speed was about 25 to 28 miles per hour. Not going to help Tampa Bay when you're trying to get people all the way from St. Pete to Tampa. It's just too long of a distance and too slow of a speed. But now starting to look at that third generation vehicle, we're carrying up to 16 passengers and almost 40 miles per hour top cruising speed. So you can see as the autonomous technologies advance, we have more and more opportunity to apply it here in Tampa Bay. And the thing that we're particularly focused on within the plan is if you take this platform that generally operates with, in a lane with other vehicles, give it its own dedicated lane. Will it go faster and will it connect people from those activity centers quickly and efficiently? So looking at all these different transit modes, we applied them to the top performing connections, those dark blue lines. And we did that by looking at jobs and population characteristics and really understanding who we're serving. Are we serving commuters or are we serving inter-regional trips? So in step two, after we applied those transit technologies to those top performing connections, we came up with 15 projects. So within the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan, a project is defined as a connection and a transit mode. We had those 15 projects and we had five evaluation criteria, so a five by five evaluation matrix. The criteria are shown here. The first is we looked at how well is that going to compete for those federal dollars or what that Federal Transit Administration rating is. But we also looked at the return on investment. So for every dollar invested in that project, what could Tampa Bay see in return? Of course, we looked at the in impacts and benefits of that transit project. And for an overall sort of 20% of the overall uh, rating, uh, we used the public input that we received from the workshops that we held, one in each county. So the scoring is very simple. I talked about that five by five matrix. Each project could receive a one through five. We're comparing all the projects to themselves and it's simply broken out by quintile. So the lowest quintile receives a one and the top quintile within each category receives a five. And based on the technical rating, what we're finding is the I-275 corridor, essentially connecting Wesley Chapel, USF Tampa to Gateway to St. Pete, did very well, whether it's rubber tire and exclusive lane, which is tied for first place, but light rail along that corridor also did well, coming in at the fourth place. The next connection that did well was in or around the CSX corridor, connecting downtown Tampa to USF. Again, we saw rubber tire in an exclusive lane, doing very well, tying for first place, and uh, light rail along that corridor coming in at third. Now that was just the technical which is four of those five criteria. The fifth criteria, the public opinion, is what's shown here. And what we saw from the folks that came out to the workshops is that there was a very, very much an interest in rail technology or steel wheel solutions. As you can see, the I-275 corridor, again, coming in at one of the top projects. The CSX North also came in, again, very high. But you can see the mode for each one of these transits is really focused on 
you know, light rail, commuter rail, and what have you, except for rubber tire and exclusive lanes on I-275 also did very well coming in at second based on the public opinion. Now, if you break that public opinion down county by county, uh, Pasco County was interested in the CSX connection as well as the I-275 connection, really focused on the I-275 connection with a number of different modes. Hillsborough County, the CSX was definitely a big part of conversation, including the I-275 corridor and light rail was definitely was preferred from the workshop participants. Pinellas County, we saw I-275 again being a predominant connection that people were interested in talking about with the different modes. You can see here rubber tire and exclusive lane as well as light rail. So when you combine those two, the technical rating, the four criteria, and then add the fifth criteria of the public input, what we see is the, some of those ties for first place were broken by that input, but bottom line, what we're looking at is the same two connections really rating the highest. And going into step three, what we're going to do is focus on those connections and continue to evaluate a number of different transit modes, uh, both steel wheel, light rail, commuter rail, and on the rubber tire side, we're going to look at the rubber tire and exclusive lanes, and even opportunity for rubber tire and mixed lanes to identify how we can move these projects forward and how we can implement that. And that'll be part of that implementation plan that we come forward with in January timeframe. Now let's take these top two connections and bring them back to our the purpose of the plan. We said our purpose of our plan was to find projects that compete well for federal and state dollars. Those two corridors do that. We get basically a preliminary medium rating, which is what's required to get into the program. And there's definitely some things we can do to make those projects even more competitive as they're just making that medium rating. And we're going to focus on that in step three. We talked about technology and all of these projects, all these connections, we're always going to look at autonomous solutions as being part of that recommendation and part of the implementation plan. And then coming back to serving Tampa Bay, those two corridors really connect the core urban centers of our region, connecting those key activity centers with all the communities, especially the higher density residential areas, and really serves Tampa Bay both today and tomorrow. So in step three, we're going to continue to focus on those alignments. We're going to look at phasing projects along that corridor so we can prioritize all these for implementation and develop them and bring them in to that draft implementation plan. Now, that draft implementation plan will have information for all the projects identified in the regional transit vision whether they are projects that were identified as a light, a light blue line or a dark blue line, we will have information of how to implement all of those projects in the transit vision, but we're going to specifically focus on identifying the core details surrounding those top performing projects that we think had the best chance of receiving those federal and state dollars. So that concludes our October update for the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan and really summarizes everything that we've done through step two. Please join us at uh, tbregionaltransit.com for updates on the plan as we progress through the next couple of months. And please look for our next update, which will be in the November or December timeframe. Thank you.